Emily was the first girlfriend I ever had. I liked her, I just didn't like like her. And a few years later, and a couple fake crushes I'd made up to throw people off my scent, I met a guy. And I liked liked him. But what would mom and dad think? They were Bible-thumping Pentecostals, and so were my aunts and uncles and cousins and best friends. My grandparents were the pastors. As far as I knew, I was a sin. And for a long time, I prayed and begged and pleaded for it to go away. And after leaving God countless voicemails and never hearing back, I quietly realized he just didn't mind. Why should he care if he had a queer on his side? Mom and Dad had done a great job of building a life for me. But as I got older, the ornate gold and silver that adorned the crown molding revealed itself to be nothing more than a sloppily applied gilded lining. I went to my friend's house and realized our linoleum kitchen floors, dirty, crusty stove, paled in comparison with their polished limestone and marble countertops. They drank straight from the tap. I wouldn't dare risk that in my neighborhood. Slowly, my paradise was shown to be nothing more than an imitation, pulled by people desperately reaching for scraps, nonchalantly brushed off the table of a feast. Life was okay for a time. We went to school, my sister did sports. Mom and dad were doing great at work, but it was all crushed under a cascade of events. First dad died, cancer. Then mom got sick and my sister dropped out of college to care for her. We were scraping by before. Now we are sifting silt through gold fields already stripped of anything valuable, excitedly holding on to the tiniest flakes in the hopes that things would get easier. It didn't matter at this point that I liked guys. Who cares that I'm gay at a time like this? I sure as hell didn't. As my last year of high school drew to a close, college was on the horizon. I needed to get out. I chose a school as far from California as you can get. I told everyone since I wanted to study politics, DC was the perfect place. But in reality, I was just like a bug scurrying and hiding and running away from the realities of my life. I didn't come out in college. I just introduced myself as Obed and talked about how hot the guy at the gym was. People got the hint. This was my first chance to really be gay. Grinder was my go-to app for when I was bored in class or on a Friday night. I leaned toward white boy, but was pretty open for everybody. I'd have my flings here and there, and my gay little heart was content. And then I saw my white friend's account. He was perfectly average, just like me. But based off the messages he got, you would have thought he was the sexiest man in the jungle. I talked to other black and brown gays, and they said they saw the same thing. All of a sudden, my lean towards white men gave me a sour taste in my mouth. Now I'm not a dumbass. I know what white people are like. I know employers are more likely to push my application to the side because the name on it says Obed. And people have said racist things to me, told me to go back to Mexico, standard racist stuff. But that's easy to brush off. I just yelled back at them or wrote them off as assholes. This wasn't that. For the first time, I was confronting racism, served as a smile, hushed tone, and a Sorry, only in white guys. I'm brown in America. I know what white people are like. It was naive of me to think that because a person is gay, they still weren't white. Now I can already hear the clamoring of the, it's just a preference racist gays. Yeah, it's a preference because white people made it one. And I was caught up in it. I was the one telling people, sorry, not into black guys. About a year after gay marriage was legalized in the U.S., I began reflecting on what gay people had won. Great, I can get married at some point, but I'm 20, so that won't be for a while. It seemed like the only thing that changed was now white gays can enjoy the fruits of white supremacy without having their gayness get in the way. They could be CEO of a bank that evicts poor people like me. They could become the idealized body now that gay was okay. They could join the military and kill people across the world with the peace of mind that they won't be discharged. All my black and brown gay friends are still broke, lonely, and oppressed. We were and are tired. I've lived the dehumanization of white supremacy. I breathe it in and out every instant of my life. I see how it's broken my friends. Imagine how they see me. And I've been called faggot, laughed at, and mocked. And I believe in God. And this isn't what he wanted for me or any of us. God doesn't raise prices of life-saving medicine for profit. 
God doesn't disown children for manifesting their existence as queer. And God don't call me spick. People do this. Now this is normally the part where I implore white people and homophobes to see that we're all the same and we all bleed bread and we should hold hands in kumbaya and have a jolly time. Except we're not the same. Karl Marx says that men make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but under circumstances already existing, already given and transmitted from the past. The circumstances we live in today are ones of capitalism and white supremacy and homophobia and more. And we can never be equal so long as the oppressor exists. I do not wish for equality. I dream of liberation. And when I thought about liberation, I used to think of the antithesis of my life. We get to keep our house like the white family. My parents get good health care like white parents. We drink from the tap like my white friends. I hold hands walking down the street with the man I love like straight couples. But that isn't liberation. That's an entire world built on my ancestors' back, built on their pain, built on mine. The opposite of the oppressed is not the oppressor. It is the liberated. And the oppressor ain't free either. You're paranoid. Do white people think I don't notice when you clutch your purse a little too tightly on the elevator? Do capitalists think we just push aside their violent reactions to our strikes and marches? When police shoot black people with bullets and tear gas, do they know their fear is showing? And deep down, do you know how your world came to be? and just how close it is to always falling in on you. And I don't care to live in this world. Queer theorist Jose Esteban Munoz wrote, we are not yet queer. We may never touch queerness, but we can feel it as the warm illumination of a horizon imbued with potentiality. This is clear as day when I reflect on my life as a gay brown kid, but the statement goes further. This potentiality extends itself into all facets of life. We are not yet human. I cannot look at what racism and capitalism and all other man-made systems have turned me into and say that I am. I see the way my oppressor acts and know that you can't be human either. There are an infinite number of potentialities for us to exist in, but they won't be created by loving oppression away. A river doesn't carve down a mountain into a canyon by loving it. It does so by struggling against it over time and without compromise. Munoz says the futurity of queerness propels us onwards. The promise of a genuine humanity should do the same. Asada Shakur said it best. I believe in living. I believe in birth. I believe in the sweat of love and in the fire of truth. And I believe that lost ships, stared by tired, seasick sailors, can still be guided home to port.